leadership is not about making people <laughs> do anything. And I see so many horrible bosses, entrepreneurs and non-entrepreneurs, who think, I got the title, I'm paying you, I got the money, you do what I tell you to do. And what happens is you'll get compliance from that, but you won't get excellence from that. You know, and that's something I learned from Mr. G. Mr. G, can, can we highlight that for one second? I love that. You'll get compliance from that. Yes. But you won't get excellence from that. Whoa. Yeah. Because- Elaborate on that for just a second because I'm going to it, it, it perfectly segues to where I want to go. Because okay. I want to get into the entrepreneurial mindset. Yes. And, and I know you're an expert in that area. So let's start there. Here's compliance. Compliance is, if you give me a raise, I'll do it. Compliance is, if somebody's going to punish me for coming in late, then I'll come in on time. But if you ain't watching me, I'm going to come in when I can come in. Compliance is, um, and here's the thing about money. I, I learned this lesson when I was a student. My first, I was editor-in-chief of my college paper. And, of course, nobody's getting paid. This is all volunteer work. And I learned that money is a minimum requirement. It's not a motivator. Like if, if you, compliance is, I'm going to do just what I need to do, but no more just to make, just to get the check. Well, that's people that's going to do, they're going to be mediocre. They're going to do the minimum. They're like, I'm just trying not to get fired. You know, that's all I'm trying to do. And I'm not doing anything more than that. I'm going to do the bare minimum. And we know a lot of companies and a lot of industries where the bare minimum, you know, it'll keep the company open, but it ain't going to get you nowhere. Correct. But that's what I'm saying. Compliance is when you are making people do it. You know, when, if you're, even if you're raising your child, they're only doing it because if they don't do it, you're going to take the PlayStation away. They're not doing it because they really want to do it. They're doing it because you're holding something over. So my thing is, if, you gotta, if you're growing a company, you got 50 employees, how many feet do you got to put on people's necks? I mean, but, you know, like, you want to be a game warden? You want to be a sheriff? <laughs> or do you want to be a CEO? <laughs> You know, so you go. if all you want is compliance, then, you know, then you got to pressure and push and punish. But if you want excellence, lead, uh, the great entrepreneurs know how to get you to want to do, to reach that goal, to achieve that mission as much as they do. Whether you're in the mailroom making $20,000 a year or you're a vice president making $200,000 a year. The, the leader gets you to say, Man, I may be only in the mail room, but this is going to get done right because we got to get to that goal. We got to, we got to serve, you know. And so the leaders help you understand, first of all, who are the people who already are predisposed to excellence? They're not, being, they're not doing their job well because I'm making them do their job well. They're doing their job well because they just like to do their job well. Then how do I position them to win? If this person likes, you know, um, accounting, and that's what they're into, they're going to do a good job because that's what they're into it. My job as the leader is to point them toward the goal and say, if you do your accounting as well as you do it, we can reach that goal. That person will, want, will run through walls for you. There you go. That's the difference between making somebody do it and serving their agenda, making sure their agenda aligns with your agenda so they want to do it. They want to do it for themselves. Great leaders get people to want to do achieve the goal for themselves, you know, and that's when you see these leaders that people like run through walls for. They're, they'll do any. They'll they don't. They're not looking at the clock to see when it hits five o'clock. They're forgetting it's five o'clock. Oh wait, it's seven o'clock. That's right. I ain't done yet. I'm not. I can do another half hour because it's got to get done. We got to achieve this goal. And all the great entrepreneurs I've ever met, uh, and, and and this doesn't mean they have to be extroverted. You know, people have this image of the. Like Mr. G was a big personality, but I know some people who are very quiet, extroverted leaders, but who know how to, to, uh, to aspire people to want to achieve a goal, to, 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 and then to give them the materials and the encouragement and the belief in what they do so that everybody gets to where they want to go. Um, one of the lessons I learned when I first got put in charge of people at Black Enterprise that goes to this idea of motivation that I think the best entrepreneurs understand is I, the lesson I learned, I said, great entrepreneurs, they screen for aptitude, but they hire for attitude. 
they screen for, for aptitude, aptitude or ability, yep. but they hire for attitude, meaning elaborate. You may, let's say you're trying to hire um, a, a, a VP for your business to, to be in, in charge of, of operations. Yeah, you want, if they're going to a good school and, and they, you know, they got lots of experience and on paper they look good. But then when you meet them and you find that they got a negative attitude, they don't know how to talk to people, they, they take credit for other people's work, that their attitude is a poisonous attitude no matter how great their aptitude and their ability might be. The, the, the mistake I made early on was like I was so blinded by the resume that I would forget about how is, who is this person as a human being? What is their attitude? You know, or, or is this someone that's going to make everybody on the team play better or play worse? Just like in sports. We know a lot of athletes look great on paper. They may even look great in practice, but somehow you put them in the game and everybody else in, in the team is like, well, I don't want to play with this dude. <laughs> you that's know, right. He, you know, he's selfish. He's, he takes credit for other people's work. He undermines me to make himself look good. You know, you know I, I'm sure you, like so many others, are, are, are watching this documentary. Um, it made, and I'm sorry to cut in, but mm -hmm. you, 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 you're, you're going to such a great point that I really need our audience to zone in on. Um, it's the last dance. It's about yeah. um, the Michael Jordan story and, and their final season. And one of the episodes <clears throat> was talking about the 92 Dream Team. And it's probably the best collection of athletes ever put together. They went and they played in Barcelona, brought home the gold. But to your point, Isaiah Thomas was left off of that 92 dream team. And the reason was, and they brought it up to Jordan. He's like, yo, if y'all want to blame it on me, fine. Everybody knows I didn't get along with Isaiah. This guy is arguably one of, if not the best, pure point guard who's ever played the sport of basketball. But he didn't get along with Michael, had problems with Scotty, had problems with Magic, had problems with Bird. And because he had problems with so many individuals who were on that dream team, even though he was accomplished, and probably, arguably, the best at his craft, his attitude left him out of history. So it really goes to your exact point that you're trying yeah. to and, and, and Let me Let me add a little, little, first of all, Michael Jordan, one of the quotes that's now being circulated a lot on social media because of the last dance, is that, you know, um, talented teams can win games. You know, talent wins games, but teams win championships. Or something. I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that you can have a group of talented individuals who, like you say, got all going on, but if they can't play together, if they can't, the sum, the whole has to be greater than the sum of the parts. And I, I mentioned that I interviewed Michael Jordan long before he became the Michael Jordan, the great, the GOAT, you know, um, everybody wants to debate who's the GOAT. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the GOAT to me, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but I interviewed him when he was a frustrated young player dropping 63 points and still losing games. I remember that great playoff game where he dropped 63 points on Boston and still lost. Yep. And he was learning a valuable lesson. I'm, I'm remembering what our conversation back then about no matter how he, he was realizing, and that game was like kind of a turning point as a young athlete for him to realize, the fact that I'm a brilliant individual player, and he was still blooming, he was still getting better because remember in college, nobody thought he was going to be what he was. He was like, I, if I drop 63 points and I still can't get past the first round of the second round of the playoffs, what's the point? What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.